Barev zis, vox chunumem zis, Hayastanits. Good afternoon. From Armenia, Dilijan. My name is Arta Kayuns. I am the global politics teacher at UWC Dilijan. I have joined the school last year, and previously I have been working in the field of conflict resolution, conflict transformation, and peace building, particularly around the topics of uh, Nagorno Karabakh, the conflict of Nagorno Karabakh and also Armenia-Turkey normalization process. Um, today, we are hosting an event uh, around the topic entitled Peace and Me. This will be the first talk within the series of events that we are planning in the run-up to the 10th year anniversary of UWC Diligent in 2024. And we are going to discuss the topic of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict or the conflict in Artsakh, as we in Armenia name that region in Armenian language. I'm happy that we have this opportunity to host one of our students today who will be talking about the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh with regards to the blockade imposed by Azerbaijan in the course of the last 45, 46 days. But before, they, before that, let me also remind everyone that UWC Dilijan is one of the schools that is based in Armenia uh, among 18 other schools of the UWC network. And as, we, as you all probably know, UWC and the mission of UWC is to promote education for a better, sustainable and peaceful life. And unfortunately, uh, the situation in Armenia and Dilijan and now in our region is not something that we can confidently say that peace has eventually arrived into our country uh, because after the devastating war of 2020, two years ago, two and a half years ago, the situation has not been changed, has not changed much significantly after the ceasefire declaration. And the problems and the conflict still goes on. And the people, Armenian people living in Karabakh, in Artsakh, are still suffering further because of the actions of Azerbaijan. Today, like I said, our, our guest will be Nana Hayrumyan, our second year student who will be sharing her perspective about the situation in Artsakh. Um, a quick reminder about the structure of our talk. It will be Nana who will start the discussion. And then for about after 10 minutes, we will also open the floor for uh, your comments, questions to me or Nana. Uh, but before giving the floor to Nana, I just would like to summarize the current situation in, in our region and um, inform everyone who is not very much well aware, aware of the situation in, in Armenia and Artsakh that the people in Artsakh are living in a situation for the past one and a half months where they have been denied major basic human rights, such as food, shelter even, security, safety, right to education, right to uh, movement, freedom of movement, and so on and so forth. And this topic has not been covered in the international media to the extent that we would expect like other conflicts have been covered simply because there is no direct violence going on in, in Artsakh, which is probably good news. But unfortunately, the other part of violence which we in conflict resolution call structural violence or cultural violence are still widespread in Artsakh. And Nana, one of our students, will share her personal story, how this blockade imposed by Azerbaijan has impacted her own basic human right to education, not to mention other major basic or basic human rights that people have been denied living in Artsakh. I will be more than happy to respond to some of your questions, if they are any, after Nana's presentation. But let me now give the floor to Nana and ask her to share her own insights about the current situation in Artsakh. Nana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Artak. Um, yes, Nana. I am Nana, um, a second year student at UWC Dilijan. 
I believe God never gives us more than we can handle. And all of the difficulties that came along with being raised in a conflict zone um, with constant discussions about peace and war have strengthened and shaped me into the person I am today. At present, for 46 days, Artsakh has been in a blockade and the humanitarian crisis keeps worsening here due to shortages in gas, electricity, food and medicine supply. Together with 20,000 school children and students deprived of the right to education, I cannot go back to UWC Diligent to continue my studies. Nevertheless, I am proud to be the seed of peace in Artsakh, giving voice to my people who are suffering through the larger UWC network to put the mission into action. I'm very happy for the incredible opportunity of sharing my experience to the world of what peace means to me, having seen two wars and currently being in a blockade. The widespread and large scale violations of the rights of the people of Artsakh due to deliberate disruptions of the vital infrastructures here, including the gas pipeline, electric lines, telecommunications and internet wires, in the conditions of the ongoing blockade put us on the verge of a humanitarian catastrophe, which keeps worsening every day. I am a young person and I can handle it. However, there are more vulnerable groups who are in a much worse situation and here is what their everyday reality looks like. Mothers who do not find diapers and food for their children, Grandparents who have had heart surgeries and cannot buy the essential medicines from the almost empty pharmacies. People in need of urgent health care that's being delayed over and over again. My neighbor whose mother died outside Artsakh and she was not able to go to her fun wheel. Parents and siblings of martyred soldiers who cannot go to their son's war graves in Armenia to put flowers. The least of all these are human rights violations that cannot be ignored. I always remember my grandmother and my parents would tell me stories about the 90s when the first war broke out here in Artsakh. And they would refer to the years of 90s as dark and cold years because they were in the same condition left with no gas or electricity, food and medicines. Those dark and cold years always seemed very far away for me as a part of the long history. But now I am the one experiencing it and I truly understand the value of these words. I, I now can relate to um, what darkness and what cold mean. Because when you walk down the street, you can see long queues of people standing in there with their food coupons in front of the stores, trying to buy basic human needs such as rice, sugar, oil, flour. I'm not even talking about fruits and vegetables that can no longer be found here. And when you go walk down the street in the evening, all the lights are shut down in all the buildings and the apartments because of the electricity shortage. And it's very dark in the evening in the city. Sometimes you have to have your phone flashlight on while walking. I've never seen the city so sad, to be honest. I want to especially emphasize the effects of the blockade on students and school children. Deliberate disruptions of gas supply deprive the educational institutions of the possibility of gas heating and hot water. The alternative for schools is online classes. However, because the electricity is cut off in different neighborhoods at different times, Zoom calls cannot be held. I can experience and relate to this in my everyday reality together with my cousins and my siblings. And, and they're sitting nearby the candlelight trying to study, harming their eyesight. This is especially worse for primary school children. My mother is a teacher and she can see how easily the school children are getting distracted every time they, they have to have a break because of gas hitting shortage. They are six-year-olds and 
it's very difficult to keep them disciplined every time they're having these breaks. And because they're learning the basics, letters of the alphabet, how to read and how to write. And what's even worse is that this is not the first time their right to education has been disrupted. And here are a few examples of the other times. I remember this incident back in 2020 when the first days of shelling um, on the September 27th, when the siren was off, we knew already mothers and children had to leave because it was getting very dangerous. And my mother had to go home from the basement to take a few warm cloths, a few essentials, and our important documents. When she was climbing the staircase of the basement, I shouted, take the purple books, they're right on my table. I didn't know if she heard me at the time or if, if it was her priority to take my purple books, but you can only imagine my happiness when I opened the bag and the purple books were there. Those were my English workbooks. I knew education was my strongest power. Later on, both in the basement and when we had to move, I was together with my cousins. We were, we were all stay, staying in one place all the time with seven vibrant little kiddies. As their elder sister, I felt I had the responsibility of providing them with the education they were deprived of. I would read them stories, I would help them with maths, and we would also have this painting sessions together with, with gouaches. I still, keep their, I, I still keep their paintings, um, by the way, and sometimes when I take them out to take a look at them, I can notice one common pattern in all of these paintings. Home, our bright Artsakh that had turned into a ghost at the time. One can only imagine the child traumas they're experiencing that stay with them for the rest of their lives. During my UWC studies, um, I had the opportunity to talk to people who come from different conflict and war zones and who can relate to these experiences. And you can clearly see that they have been even through much worse, much worse wars and conflicts. And my friends, among my UWC friends who come from Palestine, from Yemen, from Syria, and, and from all other conflict zones, the, the, the extent to which their human rights are being violated is insane. But I know that one thing that all these people have in common is the inner strength. And for the people who are living in Artsakh, for my nation, we know that we have the strength to overcome all these difficulties. And we need some kind of a bearing system to pass through. For us, it's to make jokes and laugh sometimes. And, and, and here is my favorite story um, that my granny told me a few days ago. She said, you know, they say we're the happiest nation in the world. I asked her why, and she replied, well, look at how many reasons we have to be happy during the day. When I'm lucky enough to find a few carrots or one kilo of potatoes during the day from almost empty groceries, when I buy a few eggs, when you wait for hours and then the electricity comes, the lights are on. I refuse to normalize this reality. Recently, I was having a conversation with my dad and tired from everything. I, I, I asked him when, when this will end, when will I eventually be back? And he replied, well, everything is temporary. This will also pass. I asked him if peace was temporary too. And he said, no, peace is forever. I was surprised. After 20 years of being in a military service and facing the horrors of the front line, he still believes peace is forever. It was the point I realized he owns a different peace, the inner one, starting with him and spreading around. Now peace becomes a privilege when you go to sleep with grand plans and wake up from the sounds of bombing. When you light up a candle to study in the evening because there is no electricity. When Santa brings no Christmas presents to Artsakh because the road is closed. 
when you see your 89 year old great grandmother shivering and covered in multiple layers of scarves because there is no gas heating. When you visit someone's house and bring them half of the kilo of potatoes you have because you care for the well being of their kids. When you adapt to the conditions of the blockade and you thank God every single day that there is no ongoing war. When your child asks you for bananas and you remain silent, because how do you explain her no bananas are coming to Artsakh, the road is closed. When your grandmother gives you the well-preserved last piece of candy and says, eat this now, we won't have it later. Peace becomes a privilege when you are called a hero for living in Artsakh, while all you want to do is to be able to live freely and create in your land. This is no longer about the political or economic, but about the humane. One human would not disturb another's peace if they realized other human beings are just like them. If the leaders starting wars and blockades at this simple yet important understanding, they would not violate others' human rights. Eventually, we were sent to the earth with the mission to create, not to destroy. And let's not be doomed to wait, thinking there is nothing else we can do. Instead, as an international UWC community, let's make a choice of sustaining peace with ourselves first, starting from simply showing care for those who suffer on the other side of the country, spreading to the world what is happening on the other side of the planet, and not ignoring the voice of 120,000 people in my invisible republic. Because I believe the only way to make peace last forever is by letting peace begin with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nana, uh, being able to talk and present your insights from this, from Artsakh, um, you know, trapped in a way uh, in, in, your, in your country, in your land, and not being able to join us in Dilijan, not being able to, I, I believe it is very hard. Um, and also judging by from your, what you just described, it is indeed very valuable to not uh, just read about uh, the news, uh, what's happening in Artsakh, but to listen, to learn from, from people living there. I think you raised a very important question there about, about peace, so what eventually peace is, and whether we will be able to live in peace in the future. Just as a reminder, we have been living in a situation of conflict and war in Armenia and, and Karabakh for the last 35 years. There have been two devastating wars. There have been some situations with no war, no peace. There have been some negotiations also going on. But eventually, we failed, basically, to make sure that the fragile peace that at some times in the history of these 35 years we were able to achieve was preserved. So my question for us, for you, for me, myself, and everyone else in the UWCD and everyone else in the UWC network would be, have we done enough ourselves as you know, people living in Armenia, not necessarily representing any political party, not being able to make any decisions for as, as, as politicians, but do you believe there is an there is a the people have to be empowered also to demand some change and achieve that change? So that's one thing for us to contemplate. Maybe not given an answer right now, but to start thinking. So what is the role of everyone living in Armenia to bring peace in Armenia, Karabakh, Azerbaijan, and elsewhere? And the second question that I I, I just have I don't have the answer obviously for the first one. Well, I do have, but I, I don't want to give some answers now. But also the second question, whether we have been able to understand that we are living with Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan is in one region and we have been living for many years now and we have been, we have been in, in a cycle of violence and conflict with each other. What would require for us as Armenians and Azerbaijanis to work together and change this cycle of violence to achieve long-lasting peace in the region. 
do we have to rely on others to work for peace, international community, our governments, or we can work together, perhaps using the platform of also education, such as the UWC, and then eventually serve the mission of UWC also to, to work through more sustainable and peaceful world. Do we eventually understand that in order to build that peace, we have to engage with our neighbors? We have to find a way acceptable for both parties, both sides of the conflict. And these are some questions that will require some work, not necessarily engaging with the other side of the conflict, but also doing own reflections, own, own research, own findings, building upon our own knowledge and education to understand how others have overcome such terrible, difficult situations in other parts of the world. Can we use some of the approaches to build peace that others have been able to do? Or we are destined to live for other, another decade or so even more in conflicts and wars unless something significantly changes in the world or in the region or whatever. Just some questions to think about. Maybe there will be some questions from this particip from the participants of ours. And I can see there are people also uh, watching us on different other platforms. So let's see if the moderators have some questions for us or if you would like to, to respond or reflect to some of the questions also raised from me. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can give a few responses um, to, to the, the questions that you have raised, Artak. Um, I think those questions are necessary for us to, to keep searching answers for um, as, as, as we are working on building on the, the, the peaceful future that we're, we're talking about in the UWC community. Well, first, um, are we doing enough for as for Armenians to, to build upon peace? I think it it depends on your role and and who you are in 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 a society. I believe um, people, especially in these difficult situations, each person has the individual responsibility of doing the things that depend upon them to 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 provide this um, to 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 sort of make peace in the circle of influences. Because not being a political figure, you cannot do much to change to change something on a larger scale. But if you take the individual responsibility of doing your own thing for, for as much as you can, that already contributes a lot to the bigger picture. Um, and for the second part, I believe you don't have to love your neighbor to 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 live with your neighbor, but tolerating each other would be enough to to have this peace um so it i, I believe in in um in a few generations we will have this future that we're thinking of because now even from my parents and from my grandparents side i believe there is too much hate towards each other and it is not possible for them to somehow start tolerating all of these difficulties that are coming along the way but as the generations um, as older generations fail the responsibility comes to us the younger ones to start building this peace and and i think that um by in by by largening our uwc network and building more educational institutions that would raise um future leaders in all walks of life um that do not want war or conflict I think that that would um, that would contribute to peace building in the world. Okay, thanks, Nana. There are some questions to you, uh, and um, there is one about some of the solutions in the current situ situation. Whether you have any ideas how to overcome this impasse in terms of the blockade, or maybe a message that should be delivered could be delivered also using the UWC Diligent Network and your peers at UWC Diligent. Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, for my peers of UWC Diligent, first of all, I've missed you all a lot and I cannot wait to be back. And um, my, my message to you all would be appreciating every moment that you have there and understanding that 
we're in a very privileged place and we have this power of changing things on a larger international network. Um, so I think um, just making this voice heard and spreading in your countries what is happening on this tiny part of the planet and just not, not ignoring all of this would be a lot like writing emails to international organizations and um, you know spreading in in all the ways because we need the international attention more than anything else now we're doing everything under our control right now from our side the the, the Armenians of Artsakh people in here um, we're trying our best to to find solutions to these everyday problems and the international attention I believe would would help us to um, overcome it um, in, a, in a much quicker way. Thank you, Nana. Um, yes, indeed, that's one of the options uh, to deliver the message, to reach out to international community, or in other words, uh, the world big powers who are able to bring any change, UN platform, possibly other international platforms, Unfortunately, the prospects are not very bright uh, in terms of the um, overcoming the, the blockade and allowing people living in Artsakh uh, to freely um, you know, move and connect to Armenia using the only possible uh, road which goes through Azerbaijani territory as a result of the 2020 war. Uh, when I said the prospects are not really bright, because there was also the uh, the, uh, the message by the Armenian Prime Minister today that eventual the, the, the eventually the Azerbaijan the goal of Azerbaijan is to gradually create conditions where people will uh, be you know feeling um, uh, people living in Artsakh will decide to leave the territory and then eventually there is no people there, there is no um, commitment, there is no possibility to claim to the, the birthright, the right to homeland and the right to, to live in a place where you belong to. So that's that looks like to be the official policy of, of Azerbaijan and in such dire circumstances and environment it will be. Um, it will take us a lot of courage and a lot of a lot of um, um, hope that um, you know people from across the world and uh, others and the international community will eventually realize the the current situation, the 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 extent and the level of the of the humanitarian catastrophe that it's been building up slowly in, in Karabakh. Because when we're, we were reading, studying conflict in other parts of the world, um, now we are witnessing uh, actually uh, what it meant when people were speaking about blockades in ex Yugoslavia or in other parts of the world when they were experiencing conflicts and violence in early 90s or mid 90s. So now this, now this is the reality as we see and we again see in a way, also a reluctance, reluctance by the international community to eventually uh, change uh, the current uh, status quo in Artsakh. Um, I believe there are no more questions. Um, so host probably we will end there. And thank you very much again, Nana, Nana, for joining us. And I do hope that next time we speak to you, we can speak face to face in, in Dilijan. Uh, hopefully the situation will change. Prospects are not very optimistic, but I do hope that at some point in time uh, that you will be able to travel and join us to TWC Dilijan. Thank you very much for everyone who joined us today. I, and I look forward to seeing you again in our uh, next events around the topic of peace and me. Thank you very much. Have a good day.